Well, hello everyone. It's Monday night once again, and in fact, it's two weeks since our last Sonar Masterclass. So it's about time for another one, and I'm glad to say we have with us today Mark Olson from Navico. Welcome along, mate. Hey, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Great to have you here. Now, mate, it takes a little while when we start these things off for our audience to arrive. You can see a few people starting to come into the room now. So, guys, if you've been to one of these masterclasses before, you know the drill. Let us know where you're coming from. Uh, say hello in the chat box there. Give us your name and your location so we know that you're hearing us and uh, and we'll get going in just a minute. But before we do that, let's spend a few minutes getting to know you a bit better, mate. So you're based in Sydney. You're a freshwater uh, specialist. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I wouldn't fishing. say specialist, but um, <laughs> oh, I've been fishing for, golly, since I was about two, so 38 years. Um Doing everything. Grew up on the coast, on the northern beaches of Sydney. So a lot of lot of salt water, um, a lot of sort of inland fishing, I guess, um, coastal stuff. Um, but probably the last twenty years, I guess, I've I've really started to get into the freshwater stuff. So um, we had a little local dam near my place uh, growing up, where I sort of cut my teeth on carp and bass and and redfin and that sort of stuff. And um, yeah, just kind of went from there. So yeah, I've been fishing comps and you know just in my spare time now for probably yeah. Over, well, over 20 years, uh, I suppose, seriously. Um, yeah, but yellow belly bass, cod, um, I suppose, are my main freshwater targets. And then, um, yeah, I love chasing jewfish and snapper and they're kind of the things I've been fixated on this this year anyway. So it's, it does vary a bit. So, yeah. All right, yeah. So, and and where, do you, where do you do your freshwater fishing, mate? Favourite so, location? Um, probably, I mean, for yellow belly, it's got to be Windermere. Like, that's probably the number... I suppose it'd be the mecca of, of, of yellow belly for Australia, yeah. I guess you'd say, in terms of the quality. And um, just, yeah, I love I love getting up to that that spot and having a crack uh, whenever I can. Um, Glenbourne Dam. Pretty good cod there too, but it's hard to get people to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, actually, I've never targeted them. So I normally okay. only get up there a couple of times a year. It's for the, the, uh, the Golden Classic and uh, maybe one other fish if I'm lucky. Um, so don't fish it as much as I'd like to, but yeah, never have actually spent the time to target the cod there. But um, definitely Copeland Dam, um, get up there a bit. Um, you know, once or twice a year. Again, it's quite a quite a trip from home. Um, you know, it's a good seven hours drive. Um, so yeah, um, get up there a bit. And Glenbourne, Glenbourne's sort of my local, I guess. So been yeah, fishing cool. that for yeah close to twenty years, I guess. And yeah, I love, I love Glenbourne. It's a beautiful dam. So yeah, the fishing's yeah, great. Yeah. So. These are yeah. all locations. I haven't fished all of these locations personally, but they're all locations that come up on the podcast. <laughs> we say we've actually got a Windermere Yellow Belly episode coming up in the next week or two. So nice. Hey, June, this could be a very handy episode for those who are <laughs> on, their, on their Yellow Belly fishing. Yeah, I de- so, like if you haven't been there, you've got to get there. It's one of those places that, you know, just trophy fish. If, if the fish is under, you know, a small, an average fish is 45 sort of centimetres, you know, like. Plus, so they're, they're good fish, yeah. They're solid, solid yellows. You can't ask for much more than that. Great sport. And they're pretty uh, pretty happy to take a lure or two, aren't they? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I suppose techniques have changed a lot over the years. Um, mm. Now it's really finesse. You know, it's, it's basically you're using rim gear, six-pound, eight-pound, you know, line and, you know, maybe eight to 12-pound leader, depending on what you want to throw or if you want to lose your lure or get it back out of the snag yeah. sort of thing. But, um, yeah, it's really – it's moved away from that, you know, trolling hard bodies or casting off the bank to, um, you know, much more finesse. Um, mm. Some plastic mm. soft vibes are a massive thing now and, um, you know, liquid crank baits, that sort of stuff. So, yeah, even, little, even yeah. little blades, all sorts of jigs, all yeah. sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sure, so Trevor yeah. right there, my, my mate from down there in uh, Newcastle. G'day, Trevor. You're off to Copeton this weekend, so yeah. – or this week. Nice. So good timing. Good timing. Very good. <laughs> All right, Mark. Look, what we might do, mate, is start to move on to our presentation. So we're going to talk about targeting all of those freshwater species tonight. You're going to run us through some of the, the various options for uh, using your sonar to find the fish and to find the fish that are actively feeding, I guess, is the other important thing. So Yeah, you know, for I'd sure. Chat about some of that. Yeah, I mean, look, it's kind of a pretty – Thought I'd keep it simple tonight, I guess. Um, just screenshots. We'll talk about some screenshots, what, what you're actually yep. seeing on the screen. Um, but, yeah, like, guys, if you've got any questions, just fire away. Um, you know, questions are where it's, where it's at. You know, we want, we want you guys to get the answers that you, you see. So fire away, and then we'll do the you, best to, to sort you out. So. You, you heard the man. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we, do, we do like questions. That's the whole point of doing these. So. And we've got a pretty good audience starting to come into the room now. So thank you to everybody who's put a comment in the chat there. Nice to know you can all hear us okay. 
it's always hard being on the uh, on the sending end of one of these, mate, because you can't see people's reactions. You can't tell whether they're able to hear you or not. So yeah. good to get that feedback. So, exactly. mate, what we might do is jump straight into some of those screenshots, if you like. So yeah, I'm just, sure. gonna, just going to just get us out of the way there for a moment. Let me just pull down those uh, those names. We don't need those. Oh, we're on the wrong screen. Let me just uh, turn that off and start again. This is what happens when you're doing things at the last minute, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Bear Sorry with me. <laughs> no, that's right. I, and folks, for, for those at home, we actually had a uh, a missing slide. Uh, my fault, not yours, mate. And um, I was trying to get it back in at the last second, and I haven't managed to do that yet. So we, I'll have a play around with it in the background while you're uh, having a chat here, mate. So... I guess uh, you know. Typically, what we do in these sessions is we go through a bit of a, a slideshow and we just talk about what's on the screen. So, let's start with slide number one, mate. What are we looking at? So what's this is a doing? slide. Yeah. So look, basically, I've uh, I've actually reached out to our um, our pro staff team uh, for a few slides. So I've got some um, I've got some great freshwater slides from Victoria from um, from one of our pro staffers down there, Steve Galvin. So this is one of his mm. actually. So this is um this is actually a cod sitting off a, a patch of bait there. So I don't know whether you can see on the um on the left hand side it's actually quite hard to see. Obviously two D sonar being a, a much lower frequency and a wider cone angle, um you don't get that kind of definition. But you can definitely see on the left hand side of the screen there there's a um there's one big solid arch, solid target. So that that's your cod, and then uh and then that sort of uh, I suppose red section. To the right of that, heading off is actually that's a school of. Um, I'd assume it's probably redfin um, okay. that that fish is actually targeting. So, I suppose um, this is this is one of the advantages of running split screens on your Lorance or your Simrad MFD. So, being able to run your, your traditional sonar, so you get much better coverage in the, of the water column, and then um, and then you can see down the bottom right hand side there on the structure side and the downscan side, um, you can actually see the individual target species, the water target, you know, the bait, and then the um, that cod sitting just up to the left of them there as well. So, um, you know, running those in tandem is a really, um, a really useful tool to, to not only see more fish, but actually, you know, really distinguish what you're looking at down there as well. So I thought that was a pretty cool, um, you know, a pretty cool screenshot. It's pretty obvious what, what's going on down there. Um, mm. I, I think, you know, for a lot of people with sonar, it's all about, I suppose, learning to trust your electronics as well. A lot of people probably see stuff like this, but they don't, um, I suppose they don't have faith that, that what they're actually looking at is a fish. Maybe they don't catch the fish or they can't get a bite or, or something like that. And, it, it, um, you know, it can kind of, people can get a bit, you know, I suppose disheartened by what they're seeing on the screen and just think, oh, maybe it's not working or, you know, that sort of thing. But I suppose, you know, just because you're not catching them doesn't mean they're not there and um, definitely trust what you're seeing on the screen for sure. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah, that's a um, that's a good one there. Um, I suppose another, just a quick one there too, on the top, the top right corner there, the um, the side scan, you can actually see the bait and the fish are actually on both sides. It's probably a little bit. It's harder for me to see now because I'm on the um, on the stream. It's a little bit smaller, but you can actually see that they're on both sides. So hmm. that tells you that the fish is actually directly underneath the boat. If it was on the side and down scan, um, just to one side on the side scan, then you'd know obviously it's off to the left or off to the right. But if you've got them on both sides. Um, it's basically directly below you. Know, You're right a couple of on its head. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. so. Let's move on. Guys, feel free, as uh, Mark's already said, to ask questions as we go along. Questions can be about fishing as well. They don't have to just be about sounder and, and how to yeah. use your, your sonar technology. So, For sure. Love talking about fishing, guys. So far away. <laughs> this is um this is another one from Steve. So I thought this was a really cool, really cool example of, um I suppose, a few things that we do. So... Again, top left hand side, you can see the sonar. You've got a really thick arch there on the bottom. So that's um that's a single yellow belly. I think it was a fifty nine centimeter yellow belly from from memory. I think Steve actually landed that fish. So um, right. you can see him on the sonar. And then on the right hand side here, you can actually see um, on the down scan, you've got fish reveal active as well. So you can see the really defined um, fish target right in the middle of that green arch. And then the, that green arch is actually the sonar return that's been overlaid onto the, um, onto the down scan image. So fish reveal is like, a, I suppose, a, um, a feature that we, we have. It's something that we've painted. Only Lawrence and Simrad can do it. Um, so it's a really cool feature. It's a great thing for guys that aren't, um, I suppose, really over their electronics and they want to be able to distinguish between bait and fish and or structure and fish, that sort of thing. Um, if you're looking for particularly freshwater stuff, um, 
fish in trees, that sort of thing, fish river is going to really help you distinguish because it will actually um, give you the, you'll see the, the down scan tree detail, but then you'll actually have the fish arches um, inside the tree. So it's really useful for that. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Now I'll read this comment out. So Lucky Phil uh, has ordered a new fishing boat with a motor guide and Lorance Hook Reveal 7X Plotter with triple shot transducer, but he's used an older sounder for a few years. He's keen to get some further knowledge, mate. You're in the right place. Yeah, for sure. That's, that's what we're all about. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> We've got another question that's come up here, though. So uh, this is Daniel Barton, and Daniel's asking, mate, would you run high gain or low gain to locate cod down deep on your Lorance? Uh, so gain is something you probably don't really need to touch too much on these units, which is a great thing. So um, they basically, they run on auto really well. You can adjust the gain to taste, but you can still leave it on auto. So what that means is um, uh, you can actually tune the screen to how you want it to look. And as you go deeper or shallower, it'll actually increase the power and decrease the power on its own to keep mm. the picture looking like, it, like the way you want it. So um, I don't know whether you... You might be talking about frequency there, Daniel, possibly, but um, mate, in terms of gain, I'd be running it on auto, plus or minus three or four, just depending on the water clarity and that sort of thing. Um, what you want to have is um, you don't want a super, a super clear water column. You do want to be seeing speckles. Like it's almost like, um, think of it like rain, like, like rain on the screen. That's noise, and, and you do want to be picking that sort of stuff up. It just gives you the, um, I suppose, the evidence that the, the sound is sensitive enough that it's picking up the particles in the water column. Um, if a lot of people will clear the, you know, they'll run their game way too low and um, they'll actually lose targets. So you'll, you'll miss bait, you might miss fish, that sort of thing. So this is a great example here um, on the left-hand side there. You can see those specks above the fish. They're just, um, they're just dark pixels basically, but that's, um, that's probably where, where I'd want it, you know. Um, you could do something like adjust your surface clutter there to clear the top of the water column up. But that sort of picture for me personally is something that I really like to see a lot of noise on the screen. It just it just gives me the confidence that if there is anything that comes under the boat and through that beam, I'm not going to miss it. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. just run it on auto, mate. Tweak it up or down a couple of you know couple of points either way, just to get that nice picture, something similar to what you see on the screen there. And uh, I think you'd be in with a good shot. Yeah, and I guess one of the points that I've picked up along the way through these masterclasses, you know, years ago. People used to say, you'd, you'd hear the experts saying, don't just take your sounder out of the box and run it on auto. You know, you need to adjust this and adjust that to, to get the very best out of your sounder. And to some extent, that's probably true. But there are a lot of things that have really improved in terms of um, what, what happens automatically these days straight out of the box. Oh, for and, sure. Uh, and and yeah, Gain's sure. probably a pretty good example of that. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Gain, range, uh, sensitivity, they call it in other, you know, other models. It's sensitivity in, um, in Lawrence, gain in Simrad. But, yeah, look, I mean, the old old days you did, you used to have to really drive your unit. You know, you used to have to tweak it all the time. If you were going deep, you'd have to turn it up. If you were going shallower, you'd turn it down. Your range and all that sort of stuff. Nowadays, it's pretty well they're smart. You know, they've got a computer inside them. They're a lot smarter than us. And, um, you know, I'd probably argue that you could run it better on auto and you'll get a better picture than you could on manual, full manual anyway. Yep. Unless you were just, I mean, you, end of the day, you want to fish, you know, you don't want to be sitting there playing with your sounder all day. You want to be able to set it, be confident that what you're seeing is, is underneath the boat and, and you're not going to miss anything. And then you can concentrate on actually trying to get the hooks in yep. it. So. Yep, absolutely. So we've got a question come up here. This is a fishing question rather than a sonar, but George Gray fishes Lake Sinclair a lot. He'd like to spend more time at Glenbourne. What tips do you have for a successful day on the water at Glenbourne? I haven't actually <laughs> fished Glenbourne, mate, so yeah. I'm hoping you have because I can't really contribute to this very much. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I suppose if he fishes Sinclair a lot, he's in he's in with a good shot because Sinclair and Glenbourne generally do fish pretty similar. Um, Glenbourne looks maybe a little bit different. It's got a lot more rocky banks. Um, it's bigger, obviously. There's a lot more timber. Um, but yeah, look, I'd be heading up towards, I suppose, the, the top half of the dam, anywhere from the narrows up, um, and just fishing those really gradual sloping banks. Uh, this time of year is kind of a bit of a changeover period, I guess you'd say. The water's starting to warm. Um, it's probably, I don't know if it's quite there yet, but um, once it hits a sort of mid to late October is, is really that reaction bite time of year where spinner baits, uh, football jigs, plastics work all year round, um, the surface lures and that sort of stuff really come into their own. So. Yeah, I'd be sort of starting at the narrows and working my way up and just uh, point hopping all the way up, throw plastics, have a, have a rod with a plastic, a rod with a jackal, a rod with a spinnerbait, and just, um, yeah, just cover water, basically. Once you find fish in a certain depth, 
um, then just target that depth. I've actually got some slides coming up later, which we'll run through where, where I use Genesis Maps to really narrow that down and um, mm. make sure the water that I'm fishing is, is the right water with the weed and that sort of thing too. So we'll cover that a little bit later. Yeah, cool. So Carl Hipsy's asking if there's any <laughs> news on version two of the live site trends. <laughs> um, that's the million dollar question. Um, I'd tell cool. you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> so, uh, just watch this space. Let me just say, watch this space. Um, you know, we're a technology company. We're always making new stuff and better stuff. And um, and yeah, let's just say there's something it's, happening. It's, so <laughs> it's, not, it's not a static space, is it? There's, no, there's definitely not. Definitely not. Yeah. Stay um, tuned. No, definitely stay tuned. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, unfortunately, sorry, I can't see you right now. I'd lose my job. So. <laughs> <laughs> we won't pressure you. We don't want you to lose your job. So, <laughs> so Matthew Forbes, uh, welcome along, Matthew. Matthew's here every uh, masterclass. So great to have nice. you here, mate. So uh, he finds his side scan to be the most beautiful part of his sounder. Why do people still run standard sonar? There's some good reasons still to use standard sonar, isn't there? A hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look. I suppose the advantages with standard sonar are around the coverage and um, frequency, so range. I mean, look, anything over sort of 40, 50 metres, you have to, you basically have to use TD, 2D sonar because it is lower frequency. It's going to penetrate further. Um, but you will see more on sonar. So, I mean, if you run, like Glenbourne's a perfect example. If you're running around with your down scanning your sonar uh, on a split screen, you'll see more fish on the sonar. And it's purely because it's covering more of the water column. Um, so, Running it on downscan, I mean, look, you'll get a better um, idea of bait. You, you'll see, I suppose, more detail, but you, you won't see as much as you will see on sonar. So I, I definitely run them side by side all the time. I'll run a, I have two, basically two splits or two pages that I use when I'm fishing freshwater. One's just a, um, a sonar downscan split on the top of the screen, and then the bottom is just a full uh, page side scan, uh, left and right. And that's my, I suppose, my search page that I use when I'm just driving around looking for, for fish. And then um, the other one is is the same, but I'll actually run a chart on the top panel as well. So the, the top panel is split into three. I'll have sonar, down scan, and chart. And then again, along the bottom, uh, side scan. So I suppose the tip with that is, is always have your side scan as wide as you can because that is shooting out really, really wide. So um, yeah, you don't want to be kind of trying to compress 100 meters of bank into a you know three or four inch area of screen. You're just not going to see any detail. So. I've just been scrolling through your slides, mate, to see whether you had something to do that uh, that showed that, but unfortunately, not this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question from uh, from Kyle. So, is there anywhere to get tempered uh, glass screen protectors for HGS Lives in Australia? Not that I've seen. Um, I made this mistake when I bought my first HDS Touch. Actually, I went online and I actually bought a screen protector for it. Um, put it on and the touch screen didn't work. So um, <laughs> just be careful with that because some of them are capacitive as well so that you actually um, sort of, I suppose, connect the circuit when you touch the screen and that's how the, the touch screen works. So if you put something over it, um, you can actually stop the touch screen from working. I haven't mm -hmm. seen a tempered glass screen protector, mate. Um, um, there might be one available. I haven't had a look, to be honest. They're pretty solid, but I wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't be stressing about breaking your screen or scratching it, that sort of stuff, unless you're trying to use your key to touch the screen or something, I think you'll be okay. Um, yeah, just, yeah, but have a look. It might be there. It's a little bit different to a mobile phone or something like that, I guess, in that it's not in your, in your pocket with a set of car keys and a... Yeah, <laughs> like exactly. Change. Yeah, unless you're a terrible it. cast and you're just belting lures into it or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, would, that would never happen on my boat, mate. So um, Don Cross is asking uh, if there's a Laurent sounder that's better suited to freshwater fishing. Not at all. No, I mean, look, they're all... I mean, I suppose the only difference between the, the models is the features that you get with them. So it doesn't matter whether it's a hook reveal or a HGS Live, they're all suited perfectly to freshwater fishing um, and, and saltwater for that matter. I suppose the only limitations are around... Um, depth um, with the hook reveal that they're, they're designed as an inshore um, as an inshore unit so anything over probably 100 meters um, you'd want to be looking at a ti or a hds but yeah look yep. there's there's no particular model that's built for freshwater uh freshwater is fantastic for sonar so i mean a, a saltwater sonar is going to work better in freshwater anyway so um yeah they're all fine i suppose it's just trying to find the unit that best suits your needs um and what you want to do with it, you know, and your budget, of course, you know. Um, mm. But I suppose that's a beautiful thing with Lawrence. You don't have to spend a lot of money and you get a lot of features nowadays. So it's pretty good. All right, mate, let's bring up another um, 
another screenshot and we can have a bit of a chat about what we're looking at here. Yeah, okay. So this is a shot of um this is a shot of Glenbourne actually. So um I thought this would be really useful just to kind of show uh, the audience uh, a little bit about what we do with Genesis. So Genesis is our um, our social mapping feature that we have. Um, you can also do it live on all, basically all our units now as well. But um, it's a it's a feature where you can basically log on to our uh, CMAP Genesis website. You can create an account. You can register your unit. And as long as your unit's not a hook X unit, you can actually download um, specific charts for your area. So where this comes into um, into play is places like Glenbourne, uh, Copeland, St Clair, a lot of those southeast Queensland dams in Victoria as well. A lot of them have been mapped. So um, I use this as, I mean, this is prices to me really. Like when it comes to chasing bass and yellow belly for that matter, I use this chart. Um, it's basically the first thing I set up when I get on the water is um, I'll get out there and I'll start searching um, and looking for where the weed beds are. Obviously dams fluctuate, fluctuate, the water level comes up and down weed beds die off, new weed beds emerge. Um, so you really got to, I mean, basically every time you go there, unless you're there every weekend, you're going to have to try and find where the weed beds sit in because obviously they hold, that holds the bait and that holds the fish um, in turn. So so what I do is um, I, I'll head out onto the dam. Um, I'll actually sound around. I'll look for, um, I'll, I've got my, my points I sort of go to all the time and I'll just sound off and up and, and look for where the weed's holding or, or where fish are holding. And then what I'll actually do is customize my um, my Genesis map and I'll highlight the depth range where that weed or that fish is sitting in. Um, the advantage of doing that is, is you can zoom back out and it all of a sudden really highlights areas on the lake that are going to be holding the water and the bait and the weed that you want to fish. So um, looking at this screenshot is a good example. So I, I sort of took the screenshot here because of those top two points on the right-hand side. You can see there, uh, particularly the one in the middle of the screen, that big pink area there, that's prime water. So that's that sort of five to six meter depth um, I've really highlighted. And um, I know straight away by looking at that, that I can drive straight up to that spot and I'm gonna have a nice big plateau of like perfect water. There's probably gonna be a really good healthy weed bed there. Lots of bait and lots of fish. So in terms of saving time or if you're, you're fishing somewhere you're not familiar with, this is priceless guys. Like it's um, it's something that probably people don't utilize enough. and um, it really is a game changer, yeah. Because once you find the area, it's um, you know, you just replicate it basically. It's all about repeating patterns. So, yeah, it's um, it really does change change the way I fish for sure. Yeah, cool. So, a couple of questions coming up, mates. We might just deviate from the uh, from the slideshow and talk about yeah. those. So, how can I make my HDS G two side scan better? Make it better. Um, I suppose. The most important things for side scan are um, obviously turbulent water. You want to try and avoid that at all costs. So nice, clear water. Make sure your transducer is in a good good spot. That's getting nice, clean water with no no bubbles, no aeration, that sort of stuff. And uh, the next one that people kind of overlook a bit is actually getting the transducer parallel to the seafloor. So a mm -hmm. lot of guys will actually kick their transducer down um, so it reads better at speed. But what it actually does is it shoots the side scan forward. It sort of skews the image i guess you'd say and it, it can actually ruin the side scan image quite a bit so if you make sure you try and get your structure scan transducer your long one on the gen 2 it'll be an lss2 um most probably um try and get that nice and parallel so even if it's um getting on the boat and just idling along because that's the speed you're using it at um getting an angle on, on what the boat's sitting at for that angle and then trying to get your, your structure scan transducer as close to parallel or as close to you know perfectly horizontal as you can that's going to really, you know, put you in a good position to to get a nice crisp um, side scan image. So anything, you know, if you want to get it better than that, you're going to have to upgrade to a, a HDS Live or something like that because, um, yeah, I mean, obviously the newer units have got better active imaging and stuff like that where the side scan is a lot better. So. Hmm. Uh, so George's question is what transducer to run on the bottom of the Minn Kota? Yeah. The Lance TI. Sure. Um, so, I mean, you can run... I've seen a lot of different setups. Um, most guys will run a HDI transducer, which is um, an 83200 transducer that incorporates downscan. You can actually buy a bracket um, with some hose clamps from Navico and that, it'll actually mount onto the um, onto the Minn Kota. Uh, I have seen some funky installs where guys have actually managed to rig and get like a total scan or an active imaging transducer on it as well. I suppose it's all about um, how much room you've got on the electric, like how big the motor is and that sort of thing. A lot of them have keels and stuff too, so getting a longer transducer onto them is um, 
is a little bit tricky. But I suppose, like, if you're just interested in fishing straight up and down and stuff, the HDI is really popular. That's what, I mean, the, the majority of tournament loads have been running for years and years. Um, and it's it's super easy to install. They're only like 150 bucks to buy. They're, they're really cheap and, um, yeah, really easy to install. So I'd probably recommend that to start with. And then if you wanted to get techie and try and get a, a side scan transducer on it, then, um, yeah, try and have a crack a bit later. Mm. All right, and a question from Ali about how deep the standard tra standard transducers allow you to see on the Elite TI2 and the HDS Live. Um, that's a bit of a tricky question. I've seen some ridiculous depths come out of the um, the total scan and active imaging transducers, like you know three four hundred meters sort of stuff. But that's not typical. Um, I'd say, look, the standard transducer, the active imaging transducer that comes um, bundled with your HDS and your Elite TIs, is probably good to at probably a couple of hundred meters, I suppose, on your medium chirp or your 83 kilohertz. Um, any deeper than that, or if you really want to fish that deep um, regularly, I'd be looking to probably upgrade to a one kilowatt transducer. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, they're designed, they're an inshore, they are designed for inshore use, I suppose, like Lowrance is a global brand. Um, they do have a kilowatt output in the HDS model, so they're not limited to that. Um, but they do come bundled with that active imaging transducer, which is, I'd say, probably 150, 200 metres. If you're fishing within that, you're going to be fine. If you're going to fish deeper than that or you want to go out to, you know, off the shelf and chase blue eyes or bass group or something like that, then you've got to invest a bit of money and, you know, buy a bunch of the transducer. But definitely, like, you know, snapper, kingies, inshore, the rivers, lakes, dams, all that sort of stuff, you covered, no problems at all. Excellent. All right, time for another screenshot, mate. So, yeah, cool. So this is um, just, I suppose, leading back to what I was saying with that chart. So I took a few screenshots. I just zoomed in a little bit further um, with each one. So, yeah, so you can see here basically the um, that nice pink area there, it's sort of sitting around that sort of seven meter mark. Um, so that's, I suppose, it changes every time. But you know, you generally find from five to seven meters is generally a pretty good depth. You will get um, weed and bait and that sort of thing. So I just wanted to get that screenshot there so you could see, um, you know, once you zoom in a bit, you can see there's this big um, kind of plateau, I guess. It comes up a little bit, almost like a little mound there on the right-hand side, and then it plateaus out. So that, um, like that sort of, I suppose, spear-shaped um, pink area that's sticking out past that island, you wouldn't see that um, unless you were running a Genesis chart. So that's, you know, super fishy area that you probably just drive straight over and you wouldn't even know it's there. Um, so I suppose that's just, I suppose, reinforcing what I was saying about um, just having a crack, guys. It is free um, if you run a Lowrance or a Simrad unit. Um, it's completely free, so just download it, register your unit, and have a play. It's, um, it really does change the way you fish, and it will save you a lot of time as well. So. Next one, mate. Can you see the next that? one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's the next one. So that's actually um, that's up inside one of the bays at... Um, at Glenbourne as well. So another area where, you know, that's a lot. I mean, I think it's zoomed into about 20 metres there. So that that um, that plateau is probably 100 metres by probably 60 metres. It's quite a big area, you know, like it's a football field size area of like perfectly, you know, perfect depth, I suppose, for, for that sort of bass and, and um, weed beds. So, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that as well just to, just to show kind of what you could see um, you know, if you do run those those custom shadings on the Genesis maps. All righty, so this is, uh, I suppose, what every codfish here likes to see. Um, you know, a good, a good image of a nice lay down there. So there's a couple of trees. looks like probably two or three trees or one big one that's broken up into a few pieces there. Um, so, yeah, this is a great example of, um, I suppose, what you want to see on your side scan. Um, you can see here the trees are, um, are quite... Uh, I suppose the, the, the facing edges of, of the uh, of the logs that are looking towards the uh, the transducer are really bright, and then you can actually see the shadows uh, sticking down off the back there as well. So um, I don't know if uh, everyone understands how side scan works, but a, a good way to explain it is basically if you imagine that your transducer is a couple of big floodlights just shining out either side of the um, either side of the boat. They're basically illuminating the bottom, and anything that's sticking up is going to cast a shadow. Um, and basically how, how long that shadow is is how far it's sticking up off the bottom as well. So you can see that the top of the screen there on the right-hand side, um, there's a, a quite a long horizontal dark shadow there um, just to the right there. Just to the right. Yeah, that's it there, yeah. 
So looking at that, like that looks like it's actually probably a standing timber. Um, so quite possibly, you know, another one of those trees that hasn't fallen over yet, or it could be a big stump, something like that. It's sticking up out of the water. Um, but that's a really good, um, I suppose, a really good example of, of what side scan looks like, what you want to see your side scan looking like, um, and just a little bit about how to interpret that as well. So um, oh, I've lost the screen. Yeah. Is that okay, better? Yeah. yeah, it's come back now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, you can even see there, I, it's a bit hard to tell on this one whether they're actually, I'd say they're probably logs because the, um, the, the shadows are going straight from the bottom to the target. But um, if you look to the left-hand side there, Greg, um, where those, you've got sort of three or four dots with, uh, with black lines sticking off them. Just a bit, yeah, just down here. Yep. So they'd be branches as well, but they could well be fish. So if they were fish, they'd actually be, there'd be a separation between the shadow and the log. Um, mm. So you'd actually see, I suppose, the, the white speck, which is the actual fish target. And then there'd be a gap and you'd see the shadow of that of that fish target actually on the bottom. There is a screenshot further along. Um, that's a really good example of that with some yellow belly as well. But this is another um, another image that Steve Galvin from um, Tech Angles sent through for me. So that's really, really useful. He's a good man, isn't he? He is a good man. He actually just texted me this afternoon saying, I'm out of lockdown. I'm, I'm back doing, um, you know, classes in uh, Victoria and New South Wales. So if anyone wants to learn how to drive their gear, um, yeah, hit him up. He's a, he's a good guy. So, um, yeah, moving away from Victoria now, this is this is up in Queensland, actually. So I'm guessing this is probably Somerset or, um, or Wyvernhoe. This is a, this is a screenshot from Lee Parkhouse. So another one of our, um, another one of our pro staff is up there. So this is a school of bass. Um, he's running a TM150 here. So this is a, a really, it's a medium chirp transducer. You can see in the top left hand corner, he's running 105 kilohertz. So it's actually quite a low frequency. Um, but it's a, it's a really wide angle, which is, which is the reason why those arches are so defined. You can, you know, it's huge arches from each one of those fish. I mean, there's a there's a stack of fish in there. It looks like probably 50 or more bass, you know. Um, a couple of them sort of actually heading with the boat a little bit on the left-hand screen there, and then he's driven over the um, driven over the school. So this is, I suppose, what you will see your sonar targets look like when you're driving along. Um, and the next screenshot um, is actually what they look like once you stop on top of them. So. Um, Oh, that was that screenshot that was actually missing. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm still trying to recover that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll come back to that one. We'll come back to that one. There we go, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I had an example of um, basically what, what the fish look like when you're driving over them and then what it looks like once you actually stop on top of them. So the, the picture does change dramatically. And, um, yeah, I just wanted to really highlight that to people as well. So. I'll see if I can get it up, mate. So uh, we've got a question from Robert about does the shading on the chart work on Insight Social Maps? Yeah, it definitely does. So, so Navionics is a separate is a separate company, Robert. So Insight um, is a is Insight Genesis was what it was called originally. It's now CMAP Genesis. So that's actually a, a charting company that we own ourselves at Navico, um, and and that's where you can actually customize your depth shading. And Navionics is, is a different company together, uh, altogether, sorry, and I, I don't think you can actually customise the shading the same way that, I, that I'm aware of. So it's definitely, um, you know, just depth palettes on your, um, on your chart options inside the unit, uh, but you have to be running a CMAP Genesis chart. So it is free, but you don't have to buy it. <laughs> so. Which brings us to a question this from John about whether there's a <laughs> dummies Genesis charts and map book. Booklet for dummies. No, there's not, but there's a lot of really useful videos online. Um, I know Nick White's done some good ones. Um, Dan Rodriguez has done a couple as well. One of my one of my co-workers. Um, but yeah, there's a there's plenty of explanations online. Um, yeah, if there's anything specific you want to know, just just let me know. But um, yeah, it's not it's not super hard. There's there's definitely you know tutorials online about how to actually download the units themselves. Um, I suppose probably the, the trickiest part is just finding the content ID and the serial number inside the unit. So that's just under, um, if you just push pages, settings, and then go to about, um, you'll see there, there'll be a content ID and a serial number. So you need those two numbers to register the unit on the website. And then once you've done that, you can download the chart and you actually, it'll ask you at the time you download, it'll say what plotter do you want to download it for? You download it for that plotter and it's only going to work on that unit. So that, that might be where you're getting caught out. All right, let's have a look at the next screenshot, mate. 
So this is the one I preemptively put up and took down again real quick. So. <laughs> yeah, so this is um, so this is another one from Steve down in Victoria. I think this is Eildon, I think you said. Um, basically what we're looking at here is a, is a standing tree under the water. It's actually quite deep. You know, it's almost, what is it, 45 feet deep uh, with that tree sitting. But towards the top of the tree is a massive school of redfin. So um, they're quite quite just you know really easy to tell what they are or well, not what they are but how much bait is there on the down scan um, on the left hand side you can see the um, the sonar screen there too so on this this is kind of I suppose a perfect example of the difference between sonar and um, and structure scan or down scan um, the sonar is giving you a much wider um, I suppose wider coverage so you'll see you'll see something's there um, you can definitely see targets and that sort of stuff but it's not until you look at it under that really high frequency down scan that you can really tell what you're looking at. So, I mean, it could be a shrub. You wouldn't actually know 100% whether there's fish in there or not. Um, but once you see it on the, on the down scan, it's really quite obvious that there's, you know, a massive school of fish on there. Like it looks like there's probably hundreds of redfin sitting on that on that tree. Um, again, down the bottom on the, um, on the side scan there too, you can see that he's actually driven pretty well over the top of it, not quite. It is sitting slightly off to the right-hand side of the boat. Um, so yeah, another good thing about, I suppose, having your situational awareness when you're driving around, having that side scan going at the same time, you might see something on the down scan, um, but it's not until you look at the side scan, you think, oh, it's actually just sitting just off to the right or just off to the left or smack bang underneath me if it's on both sides of the screen. Um, so yeah, that's. I just thought that was a really cool, um, really cool screenshot of, um, I suppose the difference between the sonar and the and the down scan, and just just seeing the level of detail on the on the down scan there too. Mm. All right, let's move on to another one. All right, so this is a this is a school of yellow belly. So it's actually quite a big school, and they look like they're spread out pretty well as well. So um, again, looking at the um, he's running fish reveal here too. So on the top left hand side of the screen, you can see the two D sonar. You can see some really big big targets there, um, I suppose, at the top of the school, and then possibly some smaller ones down further. I mean, they could actually be bait or something like that too, or smaller fish. Um, and then on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, you can see the down scan. So that's where it's really kind of, I mean, you can actually count how many fish are there underneath the boat if you really wanted to. Um, <laughs> but, um, it could be frustrating depending on what sort of a day you 100%, yeah. You could, be, you could do your own head in if you can't catch them for sure. <laughs> But the other cool thing about it is if you look down below at the um, at the side scan there, you can see those fish, that, that school actually shoots right out to those, you know, probably 60 metres either side. I think, is he in metres or feet? I can't see over the um, Lawrence logo, but it's, he's basically got the unit set to, um, I think it's, it must be 30 metres, I'm thinking. Um, and so he's looking 30 metres each side of the boat, and you can see there's fish going yeah. right out to either side of the boat there. Yeah, in, in, in metres, yeah. It is metres, yeah. 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 So... Um, and now, so going back to how I was talking about the shadows too, on the left-hand side there, you can see the, um, you can actually see the fish targets and then the separate shadows there as well. So um, that in, is a good example. Up the bottom. 100%. Can you, can, can you get a sense from that of how far off the bottom they are? I mean, obviously on your down scan you can, but can you get any kind of sense from your side scan? I suppose you can from the size of the shadow and how far away it is from the fish. Hmm. So... The closer the shadow and the, and the fish target are together, the closer that target is to the bottom. As the target comes up off the bottom, it's obviously going to shoot that shadow. It's going to shoot out to the side. And yep. the further it is away from the, um, from the target, the further that thing is off the bottom as well. So mm -hmm. I'd say looking at that, um, that left-hand side of the side scan and the down scan image, it gives you a pretty good idea. So that those top few targets, those top three that are sort of highlighted by the fish reveal, they're about mid-water. And then you can see the shadows from them out way out to the left hand side of the screen. So they would be those furthest shadows, like sitting just on the edge of that 455 kilohertz. Those top sort of four, four or five shadows. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Steve's just replied he had kids in the boat, so it was set to me as keeping it metric, mate. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> And, and folks, I've just put a link up as well. I didn't realize Steve was with us tonight, but I put a link up as well to Steve's Facebook. Um, so if you are looking for some help with your sonar and you want somebody to uh, to give you a hand, get in touch with Steve and he'll be able to put you on the right track. So, Yeah, for sure. And if for any Queenslanders too, we do have another another gentleman who's uh, he's got a similar business name. He's Tech Fishing. He's up in uh, up in southeast Queensland too, Nick White. So if you've got any, anyone yep. up there, he's um, yeah, he's, he's another really good guy. 
he's a good saltwater guy, and uh, Mr. Galvin's a really good freshwater guy. So you've got, got both covered. Excellent, excellent. And, folks, I've had Nick White on the podcast a couple of times. He's helped us with uh, threadfin salmon, and he's helped us with flathead in the deep water, and both times he was using his sonar. And that's the show notes there, if anyone here is an ALF podcast listener, the show notes have got all his contact details. So zap over there and you'll be able to contact him through there. Yeah, threadfin and flathead are his, his special down there. It is. Yeah. He's convinced. <laughs> yeah. I think he knows them all by name in the river there. <laughs> well, I think he's on a first name basis, definitely. Yeah, those big flathead and jumping yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So um, we've got a question from Joshua. So on the top left screenshot, there's that line at three metres. On my TI2, I get that, but a more defined zigzag. Can you explain what this is, please? Defined zigzag. So, I mean, there's a couple of things it could be. Um, I'm not sure where you are, Joshua, but, I mean, it could be something like a thermocline. Um, hmm. It could be a sediment, level, uh, sediment layer in the water as well. Um, sometimes you might catch an echo um, where you might get a, a bit of a false return sometimes here or there. Um, but it's a little bit hard to tell exactly what it is. So like that one there being in fresh water, I'd say it's probably more than likely a thermocline. Um, mm. You can also get funny little artifacts from things like outboard motors and things like that. Um, you know, you might be catching an echo off the side of your leg or, or something like that, and that can actually cause uh, like a false return in the bottom. Um, so, yeah, it's a little bit hard. I suppose every boat's different, every install's different. Um, so, yeah, being able to tell you exactly what it is um, without actually seeing your boat and that sort of thing, mate, it's a little bit tricky. Um, but, yeah, I'd say, look, if you're fishing freshwater and that sort of thing, I'd say it's more than likely a thermocline. Yeah. Typically, thermoclines are strongest as well in summer and late autumn. So um, through winter and spring, often there's no thermocline. So it can be, you know, time of year could tell you something about what it might be as well. Yeah, for sure. So a question here from Ali. Um, she's ordered a 6.5-metre boat, and she's trying to decide between a 9-inch HDS or a 12-inch Elite TI2. Which would you recommend? I suppose it comes down to what sort of fishing you're doing, Ali. Um, look, if you're going to fish offshore, fishing saltwater and that sort of thing, I'd probably lean towards the HDS because it just gives you a little bit more flexibility in regards to future proof proofing yourself. So, I mean, a six and a half metre boat's a pretty, pretty big boat. Um, you know, you could be going offshore, you might be going right out, you know, chasing blue eye or fishing the bottom in, you know, three or four hundred metres plus, you know, I'm not quite sure what sort of, um, what sort of fishing you do, but a six and a half metre boat's a pretty big boat. I probably would be leaning towards the HPS. Um, if you were fishing just inside the estuaries and the rivers, um, the lakes like we're looking at today, either one's going to do the job for you fine. Um, I suppose another thing to look at is if you ever wanted to add something like a like an autopilot or a radar, something like that, if you ever wanted to add any of those peripheral sort of add-ons, um, then you'll need to go towards a HDS. Um, mm. Yeah, it's a little bit of a tricky one because, I mean, they both do an awesome job, but um, it kind of depends on what you want to do. So, like, if you really, if you were, a, you know, a game fisher or something like that, I'd say straight away go for the HDS. Um, whereas if you're like basically just an estuary fisher, I'd say the TI is going to do the job for you really well. So um, yeah, if you want to uh, comment exactly what you what you're into, I can narrow it down a bit more. But yeah, it's a little bit um, a little bit hard to narrow it down just on like there's no there's no perfect unit for for everything. Uh, I mean, I suppose the HDS is going to do everything better, but um, but yeah, you really um, you kind of need to I need to know what you're going to do with it before I can tell you the right information. Mm -hmm. So Robert just made a comment that he fished St. Clair on the weekend and he saw fish in the shadows. So now he oh, knows. That's awesome. He so good stuff. Good stuff. Bit of confidence, mate. <laughs> now George is asking if there's anyone that does uh, sounder classes in New South Wales, mate. I so, know that Nick White yeah. travels up and down the coast, but I'm, he can't at the moment, of course, because the border's closed. So yeah, so he's you stuck down in New South Wales. He just can't get back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, we do have a um, – I mean, we've got a, a pro staff network, I suppose, around the country. Um that we can utilize for that sort of stuff. Um, I mean, I do a little bit myself from time to time, um, just, you know, with a big package or something, I can do some training with people. Um, I suppose if you want to let us know exactly where you are, I can try and um, point in the direction of someone that can help you out for sure. And we've got someone, Jason, here who's wanting to know about, uh, you know, the top secret stuff when the next <laughs> HDS model coming out. <laughs> oh, um, again, if I knew I'd... 
tell you? Well, I wouldn't tell you. But if I told you, then I'd have to kill you. So, <laughs> uh, mate, I, I honestly don't know. Um, look, HDS Live is what? It's in its second year now. So um, I'd say, you know, there's probably not going to be anything for at least another 12 months. I'd be very surprised. Um, you know, generally, I suppose three to four years, I guess, is a, is what is what we get out of them before, the, you know, the tech advances so much or it's you know we can put it into a new unit right, there's yeah. definitely nothing like he's not going to get a rude shot before christmas of a new hds that's going to come <laughs> so he doesn't have to worry about that all right so having a quick look at the the comments that are coming up but we might just zap over to another screenshot mate yeah so this is that um this is that one i was talking about with the elderly another another one from steve steve galvin so that's a really cool example of what a school of fish looks like. They're relatively close to the bottom if you um, can look at where the shadows and the, um, the targets are. But that's like a really good example of a school of yellow belly. That's exactly what you want, what you want to see when you're on your, um, on your side scan driving around. Um, and there's a log out to the right-hand side of it as well. And it's mm -hmm. pretty obvious what that is, but that's a lay down there too. But I just thought that was a really cool example of what people need to be looking out for. I mean, bass are going to show the same as that. Jewfish are going to look like that. Um, you know, brim, uh, any of that sort of estuary species, they're going to, they, that school up, they're going to show up like that. So um, if you're seeing that on your screen, guys, uh, get your little in there, that's for sure. All right. So Ali's just clarified she's mostly bay and some ocean fishing in SEQ. So. Yeah, okay. So look, Ali, I'd probably lean towards the HDS and purely from that comment being a bit of offshore coastal stuff, um, having a HDS is going to give you the, the ability to actually run two transducers. So you get bundled with a transducer, an active imaging um, transducer, which is going to do everything for you. But if it comes a time where you're actually getting out a little bit wider and you just wanted to maybe shoot that little bit deeper or something, having the HDS is going to give you, you the ability to, to simply just buy another transducer and just add it to the boat, plug it in. You don't have to lose the other one. You can run them both. Um, and it just gives you that extra flexibility, I suppose, where you can you can fish inshore, but then you can also cater for offshore just by switching your channel over to um, to a deeper transducer. You can't do that on the TI, so I'd say, um, yeah, definitely HDS. So, mate, that is the end of your slide deck, and the questions are starting to slow down. So, folks, I'd just like to extend the invitation uh, for the last few minutes. If you do have any final questions you want to fire at us, now is the time to do it. And uh, while we're waiting for any final questions to come through, I'll just let you know that next, not next week, uh, a fortnight today, when we do our next Sonar Masterclass, we're going to have Lee Rayner on board again. So Lee did one for us a while back on uh, Simrad uh, gear, fishing out off the shelf for the swordfish and the blue eye and the tuna and all the big ooglies that are out there. <laughs> this time, though, he's going to take us out onto Port Phillip Bay or... I'm not sure whether it's Port Phillip or Western Port he's going to take us on to, but he's going to take us snapper fishing anyway. So um, that'll be good. And we look awesome. forward to having Lee on the, on the show again. So look, there's no more questions coming through, mate. So I guess uh, we, we, uh, we've done well. You've done it in record time. Yeah. Um, so I want to thank you for coming along. I want to thank all of our viewers today for the, the great questions that have been posed and awesome stuff. <laughs> um, uh, the last couple of days has been great. I've got a five-week-old daughter at home at the moment, so <laughs> he's giving me a ribbing. <laughs> well, uh, Trevor, dear, what would a catfish hole or nest show as? Yeah, for sure. You definitely see them. Um, look, you just see it as an indent in the bottom. You probably see a highlighted area and then the shadow from the inside. Um, but yeah, hundred percent catfish holes, uh, brim holes. They all show up. I mean, look, even on, um, I think you can even see some like big flathead lies and that sort of things will actually show up if your range is set right. Probably um, if you're looking for that kind of level of detail on the uh, on the bottom, I'd be setting your range pretty narrow. So particularly on the side scan, you'd want to be probably three times the depth, something around 20 metres range, I guess, max, if you want to really sort of dial in on that, on that smaller stuff. Um, but, yeah, you definitely can see it, mate. Any changes in the bottom? I mean, look, even like changes from rock to clay, sand to mud, that sort of stuff, you will see all that sort of detail 100% mm. um, without a problem. Yeah. Mm. Good stuff. All right, guys, look, thank you very much. Thank you again, Mark, for uh, for coming along and speaking no to us. It's been, it's been fantastic. <laughs> Thanks for your time. Look forward to doing it all again in a couple of weeks' time, mate. <laughs> awesome, that's it.